Good morning. So good to see you here. So glad that you chose to meet with us here at Grace Chapel today. I just want to invite you, if you're able, to stand with us as we enter into our worship. Because there is joy in this house. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. as we lean on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship and a joy divine to lean on his arms.
Good morning. Welcome to Baker Christ Chapel. You may be seated. It's good to be here with you on this Sunday morning. My name is Kim Eifert. I am one of the pastors here at Grace Chapel. Um, at about 10.30 last night, I found out word that our um, lead pastor, Joshua Manning, is out sick today. Um, so you're going to get a lot of me this morning. Surprise. Yes, surprise, surprise. Why are you cheering for that? Joshua, if you're watching, we are praying for you. <laughs> which leads me to uh, welcome our online community, which might include Joshua Manning this morning. Um, we hope that um, if you're out there, that you're, you know, say hi in the comments, share the feed, let people know that you're watching with us because otherwise you are out there, out in the internet world and we don't know that you're with us and we wanna know who is worshiping with us today. Which leads me to our connect cards. If you are in the room with us and you are new with us, we would love for you to fill out a connect card. They are the green cards, they're white and green on the backs of the chairs in front of you. Um, if you're online, there is a link in the comments that you can click to do that there. Um, this is just a way for us to get your name, your email address, your phone number, whatever you're willing to share with us so that we can reach out to you later in the week, answer any questions you might have about Grace Chapel, um, learn a little bit about your story, tell you a little bit about our story, and you know, schedule a lunch, schedule a coffee if that's something you're up for, um, if you're ready for that. Um, we won't send you a million emails, we're just going to reach out and see what questions we can answer and get to know you a little bit better. If you've been here a million times or this is your first time, we have our QR code up here on the screens. This is an opportunity for you to register your attendance with us. It's just gonna ask you your name, what service you're at, if you're online or in the room with us. And um, it's also gonna be a place where you can register any prayer requests you might have. So if you have something going on in your life, a joy, a concern, something you wanna share with the pastoral staff, that's gonna come directly to us. If you um, have a specific, if you want a phone call or a sp very specific prayer, be sure to put that in there so that we know what you need from us. Um, we will probably send you an email, 
reach out, let you know that we're praying with you, for you and with you. Um, we know that prayer is a way that we connect with each other and we connect with our God, so we want to hold that in, in high importance here at Grace Chapel. Um, those are most of our logistical things, and then we've got some announcements of some things that are coming up here at Grace Chapel in the coming weeks. I didn't mention this at the beginning, but this is the first Sunday of Advent here, and so we have our Advent candles. We are talking about hope, and we will be talking about things like peace and joy and love as we journey towards Christmas together, and part of that is a bunch of activities that have to do with Advent and Christmas. Our very first one is, well, no, we have a pre-first one. We don't have a slide for this, but this is just a reminder that if you are in 6th through 12th grade or you have a child who is in 6th through 12th grade, oh, we do have a slide. Um, 12 to, it's 12 to 2, though. That's why I didn't have that slide up. I want to make sure, so some parents are like, oh, it's at 1.30 because the slide says 1.30. It's 2. So kids, want to hang out or youth, um, we've got some queso. We're going to talk about hope. We're going to play some games. We're going to have a good time. After the service, we're going to meet in the youth room right over here, and we're going to have some fun. So I'll be there. Sam will be there. It'll be great. Um, and our first actual announcement is that we have our up-and-coming family advent and worship night. Advent Family and Worship Night. It is this Friday, December 6th, from 6 to 8 p.m. This is going to be an event where we've got crafts and things and activities for the kiddos in the youth room and in the lobby over here. We're going to have some cookies and some cocoa and some fun things like that. And then we are going to move into this space where we're going to have a musical program. We're going to start that with our children. They've been learning some songs in chapel. And I know that Ms. Michelle sent out some YouTube links that I'm sure you parents are loving. Loving the YouTube links on how to learn these songs. So um, we're watch, watch for some more information about that this week, but do come from 6 to 8 on that night. We're going to have a really good time here. And at the end of the night, we always end with the traditional s'mores. They're going to be, we're going to fire pits outside, and if you want to grab a s'more before you head out that night, that is a good thing that we like to do. So um, come to that event. And then on the next Saturday, December 14th at 2 p.m., we have our consecration worship service. Now, this building has been a long time coming. If you live around here, you've seen it being built. If you've been a part of this church, you've known the plans from before that. And now we are finally in it, and we are going to have a consecration worship service. And consecration is just a fancy word for blessing. The bishop is going to be here. He is going to offer some words of encouragement for our community. Um, if you have been around this community for a while and you know some of our former pastors, Chris Yost, Courtney Schultz, Alec Williams, Alex Williams, they are all going to be here. So if you wanted to catch up with them and see what's been going on in their lives, this is a good time to come and do that. And since the kids don't really care much about the bishop, um, we're trying to make it exciting for them as well, so we're going to have some bounce houses and some fun activities for them to come and hang out with um, at that consecration worship service. And then the very next day, on Sunday, December 15th, that next morning, during our normal worship times, we're going to have our Music Sunday. This is the week where we talk about joy and as a part of our Advent um, worship, and we know that music is a place where people always feel joy. And so we are going to have a very music-heavy service. There'll be a short message from Pastor Joshua or me, um, but mostly we're going to turn the reins over to these guys. And we all love what they do. So um, that's going to be a fun Sunday. That is going to be also be an all-family. So like today, where we have all the kids in worship on the first Sundays, we're also going to have all the kids in worship on that particular Sunday too. So plan to be here for that. It's going to be amazing. And then on that same day, because we didn't have enough going on, at 5 o'clock on Sunday, December 15th, we have our second annual Grace Chapel Trivia Christmas Edition Night. We always have Christmas Edition as if we've had another edition. Um, <laughs> But that's a long story. But that is going to be at 5 o'clock. There is a QR code to, or a link to sign up for that on our website to kind of give us an idea because our meat ministry is providing some sandwiches for that. So if we could get some idea of how many people are coming, that would be amazing. Um, so just bring your competitive spirit. This is a family-friendly event, so if your kiddos want to be in the room with us, that's great. If that is not their jam and they want to go watch some Christmas movies and drink some cocoa or do some other things in another room, we're going to have a space for them as well. And um, nursery kids, there'll be something for them to do. If you are youth age, 6th through 12th grade, you have have to come because as I mentioned last week and I mentioned in the previous service, y'all won last year. You won the entire trivia event. You sat with Sam, you were a collective effort, and you want to defend your title. Yeah. Come and join us on this night. It's going to be a really good time. That is trivia night. And then one last um, announcement that we have is something you may have been waiting for so that you can help plan your Christmas Eve worship and your, your day on Christmas Eve. Our Christmas Eve worship times are going to be at 11 a.m., 3 p.m., and 5 p.m. That 11 a.m. service that is called a family service, it is still going to have candlelight and a sermon and all of the things you've come to expect at a Christmas worship service, but it's going to be just a little bit more kid-friendly. There's going to be some interactive pieces for, 
for the kiddos. So if you've got some young kids, then they want to come to that. That's going to be great. You can get that. I don't want to say get it over with. You can celebrate the birth of our Savior with your children at 11 a.m., and then you have the whole day to do all the other things that you want to do with your family. So that is our Christmas Eve worship. And that is the end of those announcements. So... I'm going to stop talking for a second. I'm going to give you a chance to talk to one another. We believe here at Grace Chapel that we belong to one another, and the best way to do that is to look at the person next to you, get to know them, and see God in their eyes. So chat amongst yourselves, and then we're going to have a children's moment in just a sec. So glad to see you all here. It's my turn to talk right now. After my turn to talk, I believe it's Pastor Kim's turn to talk. <laughs> um, well, I am so glad to see you guys here. Today is, the, is a very special day. It is the first day of the season of Advent. So do you all know what Advent is? Well, good Mommy opened her Advent calendar. Yeah, Advent's really special like that. You get Advent calendars, and you said December, and Aaron, you know? Oh, I think you're thinking of Lent. That's very smart, though. Very good. Okay, so you guys have heard of Christmas, though, right? Yeah, you all know what Christmas is. Advent is the season where we're waiting and counting down till Christmas. Okay, and each week in Advent has a different theme. Yes. Yes, you light a candle. Oh. Yes, you opened all of the things early. That that can be distracting for sure. Um, well, Aaron's right. We light a candle because each week has a different theme. And the th you are going to light one. And do you know what the theme for this week is? You have a guess? I don't know. You don't know. It's hope, okay? The theme for this week is hope. So you know what it is? What is it? Hope. That's right, Judah. It's hope. So do you guys know what hope is? Yeah, I see some nods. Okay, so hope is when you have that good feeling inside you because you know that some good things are going to happen, right? So that's hope. And hope in the Bible means that we feel confident, we feel good in what God has promised us, okay? Because we have hope in God's promise. Yes? Like if you're feeling happy. Like if you're feeling happy, that's right. Yes? Well, you can feel kind of sad and still have hope, okay, because we have hope in God, because we know that God has promised us a lot of good things, right? And during Advent, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. 
Okay. During Advent, we talk about hope in a really special way. Hope is like a tiny little seed. It starts off really small, but it can grow to something big. Okay, just like Jesus came to us as a tiny baby, and then he spread hope throughout the whole world. Okay? So I have little seeds for you today. This is actually seed paper. The seeds are in the paper, and everyone's going to get one of these as a reminder about how um, hope can spread and grow. They're ornaments, but you can plant it in the ground and grow something from it. Yeah, for real. For real. It's a little seed. You made a Christmas ornament. That's really cool. Okay? Because you are all God's children. You are all a blessing. And now Pastor Kim is going to... um, Am I real? I... Yes, they are. They're really seeds, okay? And you all get to take one home and plant it and watch something grow. Okay? There we go. All right, kiddos. I think you get to head back to your families now. But don't leave without your ornament, because it's for real. Let's see. Um, and while, while they're gathering and heading back to their spaces, I'm going to invite the Johnson family forward. Um, we talked earlier, well, they talked just a whole lot about this week. We are talking about the, um, the theme of hope. And each week we have a tradition in the church and we have a tradition here at Grace Chapel that we light a different candle to represent our different themes of the, the Advent season. And this week we are celebrating hope. So the Johnsons and our sweet Judah are going to come up. Where'd he go? Oh, he's right there. and light our candle for us. Here we go. Hi, I'm uh, Mark. This is my wife, Jen, and our son, Judah. Advent is the season of waiting, anticipation, and preparation. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Mary's words remind us that we find our hope in Christ. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. We light this candle to defy the darkness of the world. May its light remind us of the hope of our Savior. Which one? Which one are we lighting? Okay. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Let's pray. Loving God, we joyfully await the coming of our Savior, who enlightens our heart and dispels the darkness of ignorance and sin. Pour out your blessings upon us and these candles. May their light reflect the splendor of Christ, who is the Lord forever. Amen. Amen.
but I definitely would have gone. So it's me again. Glad to be up here with you again this morning. Um, like I said, I got the call that Joshua was not going to be here this morning, um, pretty late last night, um, which means I'm feeling a little ill-prepared. Um, but I think we're going to be okay. And I know that when you're feeling a little anxious or a little unprepared, it is always good to go to God in prayer. So will you pray with me? Holy, gracious, and creative God, we know you are here because you are always with us. Open our hearts and our minds to what you would have us hear from you today. Guide my words to be words of truth and words of beauty, and let them remain unheard. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, so this is, as we've been talking about several times this morning, this is our first Sunday of Advent, and that means that a couple of days ago we s experienced Thanksgiving such that it was for everybody, maybe a celebration, maybe not, I don't know, but Thanksgiving was indeed on Thursday, that we do know. Um, which also means that probably a lot of us, either over the past few days or maybe in the few weeks, depending on how early you are at this, got out the Christmas decorations. Show of hands, anybody decorated? I know that we decorated the church, and I'm super grateful for Ken and Ricky and the Jansons and Nancy Turner, anybody who helped with that. It looks amazing out there. I'm very happy about that. Um, it also means that I did also decorate my house, and um, if you're anything like me, the decorating of the house looks a little bit like current Kim having some issues with past Kim. Because past Kim always says, I'm going to pack up these boxes in a logical way. I'm going to get rid of things that we're not using that's old, that's broken, and I'm going to put it away nicely. And then past Kim eventually says, that sounds like a problem for future Kim. And future Kim has to deal with past Kim, and it's a mess. And you have to unravel the boxes, and it's, it's always... I, w I would like to get, get together with my past self and make it work better, but we unravel all of these things. And it also means that we unravel these Christmas lights, like this picture that we have up here. I know a lot of us have gone to um, pre-lit trees, um, but if you live in my house, um, I have a husband who really, really likes a live Christmas tree. And that means we have to unravel these lights every year. Past Kim did get them on a spool this past year, so that helped a little bit. Um, but also, like, a pre-lit tree is an option. It's a possibility. If you hadn't considered it, maybe. Um, it would help you unravel some of these things. So um, that's all to say that sometimes our Christmases can feel a little bit messy. And as we venture through this Advent season, we're going to spend some time over the next few weeks unraveling some of the things that happen during Christmas that we might need to unpack a little bit. Um, and this week, we're going to be talking about the idea of hopelessness. We talk about hope, and we know that Christ brings hope to all of us, but sometimes in the midst of the busyness and the craziness and the, 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 the dealing with your past self and your future self and the, and the, the lights and, and what messes we make for ourselves, um, we can feel a little bit hopeless. And so while we're 
unpacking that idea today, we're going to go to scripture and we're going to read a story from the Gospel of Luke that where we encounter Elizabeth and Zechariah. So will you listen to me to read this to you today? It is Luke 1, verses 5 through 17. Here now, listen for a word from the Lord. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in the years. Once, when, they were, when he was serving as the priest before God during the sections, his section's turn of duty, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to enter the sanctuary of the Lord to offer incense. Now, at the time of the incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified, and feared, fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have the joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. But for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or strong drink. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, we will go before, he will go before him to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready the people prepared for the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as we're talking about unraveling hopelessness, we encounter Zechariah and Elizabeth. And these are two figures who are deep in the midst of hopelessness for themselves. They lived in a culture and in a context in which um, fertility and having children was, was equated with a blessing. And the expectation was that a couple of their stature would, would have children. And they had not yet accomplished that expectation. And I think the word expectation is really important when we consider a topic like hope or on its flip side, a topic like hopelessness. Because I think it's when things do not match up, or up with our expectations that we can see hope slipping from our grasp. We um, can spiral even further beyond hopelessness into to something akin to despair. And it's the despair that can really get us. The despair seems harder to climb out of. And that's where we find Zachariah and Elizabeth today. They're expecting something, and that expectation is not fulfilled, and they end in a moment of despair. But in the midst of this despair, there's an intervening message of hope. And I don't want to. I don't want to jump too too quickly to the conclusion. But we are talking about hope. Hope today. And in the midst of their despair, God shows up. God shows up, and the story reminds us that God's transformative work can take root in even our most barren places in our lives. There is hope, and God can show up. And for Elizabeth and Zachariah, we are talking about being barren of, of being able to have children. And if you've heard me preach before, there's usually some aside that I want to offer, um, and this is, this is that aside. Um, I want to acknowledge that this time of year, with these stories, not, not just this one, but many stories in our scripture, there is always some talk about babies and babies being had and, and the babies being the answers to the prayers. And this can sting a little bit to some people who may be encountering a journey through infertility or have chosen not to have children for a myriad of valid reasons. And to people who may be sitting here today and thinking that this is really hard and I don't really want to hear these stories, I don't really have an easy fix for that or a way through it other than to say, I see you and your story is valid. And um, thank you for being here with us because these stories do need to be told because the baby at the end is the individual prayer, but the hope and the blessing and the, and the, the story that's within the story is always so much bigger than, than that one thing. But I also know that it can be hard for people. So hear that from me today. But also, as we're talking about Elizabeth and Zachariah, we are talking about their barren place as it regards to child, being able to have a child or a lack of child. And, but that barren place, for all of us, is a little bit different, isn't it? Sometimes it's our financial health. That's where we struggle. Sometimes it's our physical health. That's where we struggle. Sometimes it's our broken relationships. Sometimes it's our careers. Our careers are that space that just rubs us and makes us not really feel like we're thriving. And sometimes it's just our lives that are jam-packed full of busyness, 
but somehow still feel devoid of meaning and purpose, and that feels like the barren place for us. And the story reminds us that God has a way of showing up and giving us something different than what we expected, even when our, our expectations have let us down. God has a way of unraveling the hopelessness and sending us forth in a new way. But that's not, um, it's not just about how God shows up for us. It's also how we show up for God. It's how we show up for God. There's a phrase that I've heard a lot of times, and I really appreciate it in a lot of ways because it, 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 it clicks with my sensibilities in some ways, but in other ways I'm not so sure about it. And that phrase is that hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. And there's another phrase that's similar about how you can hope in one hand and do something else over here, but that may be not for this audience today. If you don't know that phrase, fast, somebody knows it. Um, but hope is not a strategy. And in some ways that can feel a little bit fatalist. We are here, as a matter of fact, we lit a candle today to remind us about hope. And we are always talking about God's message of hope. And yet, we might say hope is not a strategy. And I think that our story today invites us to consider what hope really looks like. Hope doesn't have to be passive waiting. Hope isn't just throwing your hands up. Hope isn't just give it up and give it to God. While that's a good phrase and sometimes we need it, it doesn't have to be just that way. Hope is something active. There's something active about hope. Um, when we think about it, where do we find Zachariah in this story today? Where do, we, where, does he, where do we find him? We find him in the sanctuary doing his priestly duties. He's doing exactly what he's called to do. He was chosen by Lot to bring the incense before the Lord, which I think might not be that different than me being chosen by Lot at 10.30 last night to prepare to speak to all of you this morning. Um, but Zechariah is doing what he knows to do. He is not just sitting passively waiting. He is faithfully fulfilling his duties, and he's not just letting the despair take over or letting the hopelessness win. And he and Elizabeth, and I think this is important, are described as righteous people. And yet somehow their goodness doesn't save them from suffering in any way. These are people who have followed God. They have followed the rules. They have checked all the boxes, they have done what God asked for them, and yet here they are in the depths of despair and hopelessness. And I wonder how many people that might feel familiar to. How many of us have looked up from our Bibles or looked up from our good works and our good deeds and our clean living and our, our purity and doing everything that we think that God has called us to do and looked around and still said, but our lives are still in shambles. What is happening? I know that that has happened to me, um, a cancer diagnosis in my last semester of seminary really felt like an absurdity in I thought I was doing the right things, but yet my life is still sort of hopeless and in shambles. And I know some of your stories, and I know the stories of the people of the world. There are marriages that last for decades, but then still somehow fall apart in the end. And there are long-awaited retirements that we work towards, and yet when we get there, we don't get to enjoy them because we're just faced with an onslaught of physical ailments and struggles that we have to deal with. We have um, career decisions that are made with the very best intentions, the best of what is gonna be good for us and good for our families, but yet somehow that career choice, that decision somehow still manages to steal our joy. We didn't make that decision lightly but somehow it still doesn't work out. And um, that says nothing about parenting. Parenting, I think, is the one. When those kids wait, turn up to have minds of their own, and we can't solve things for them the way that we think that we should, but we did everything we thought was right, that can feel really hopeless. And I wonder how many of their stories are in this room with us today, and how many of these stories are in the houses, the millions and thousands of houses that are being built around us, here, and how many of these stories are in the cars that are stuck on Denton Way and 1385 and 380? How many of these stories, if we stand behind our geography to include history and time, how many of these stories exist beyond all of us here today? And that tension between Elizabeth and Zechariah's righteousness and the despair and, that they find themselves in reminds us that hope is not about pretending that everything is fine all of the time. That's not hope. It's about acknowledging the brokenness in the world and the brokenness in our lives and trusting that that does not have the final word, that there's something else, there's something hopeful. This is the active hope that brings 
the, the, the incense into the sanctuary. This is the act of hope that continues to open the Bible. This is the act of hope that comes to worship. This is the act of hope that looks at the person next to you and learns their story so that we can all be hopeful together. And Elizabeth and Zachariah, they stand as symbols of people who are longing for this sort of liberation, this liberation from our own struggles. And they represent Israel waiting for God's promises, and they aren't that different from us. We live in a world of waiting as well. I think that that's very, very true. We live in a world where we are waiting for justice and we were waiting for healing, in a world where racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism and ageism and all of those things, all of the othering that we do to one another, we live in a world that waits for those to be things of the past. That is our hope. And that brings us back to our story. When the angel shows up, the narrative switches quite a bit. Zechariah, who was faithful and clinging to hope to the best that he could, is offered this very real possibility. He's offered this promise that he will, he will finally have the baby that he'd been waiting for. And that baby, which will be called John, will also prepare the way for the Messiah, prepare the way for the hope of the world. The angel's promise, and I think this is important, is both deeply personal, they're finally gonna get that baby, they're finally gonna have their expectations fulfilled, and it's also broadly communal. This baby will clear the way for Messiah. This baby will clear the way for hope. God's hope is for each of us, individually, every day, in every aspect of our lives, and it's for all of us. It's for the whole world and all of humanity. The good news is never just good for some of us. It's good for all of us, all of the time. And then when we think about this calling that's placed on John's life, this calling that was placed on his life before he is even existing in this world, I am reminded again how we flounder with the idea of expectations. John is being sent to prepare the way for God's arrival by changing hearts and minds. And Elizabeth and Zachariah are certainly happy to have their infertility issues finally addressed and their expectations finally met, but that's not all that's going on here. If it was, we could just call this a happy story that ends with a sweet baby. But John's story reminds us that hope is not just about our individual comforts. It is not just about us feeling good and not feeling uncomfortable. It is about us being challenged. It is a call to action for us. It invites us to participate in creating the world that we want to share with each other. John's very existence is about making a way for God to enter into this world, and maybe that is what we are also called to. We, um, there's an action that goes with our hope. When Michelle passed out the little cards, the, the for real cards um, to the kids, they don't just get to hope about those and have a plant grow. They have to do something active. They have to plant it in the ground, they have to water it, tend to it, put it in the light. There's an action that comes with our hope. And today, it is easy for us to feel overwhelmed in the midst of you know, the obvious division that we have in our world, and climate crises, and political crises, and um, violence, and all of the financial issues that we're having in the world, the cost of eggs, and who's in charge. And, um, but we also find in this passage that there is a call, that even in the midst of all that, that God is at work. When we can't see it, God is still at work but there's a calling for us to act. This hope, again, is not a passive thing. It demands something of us, just like it did of John. John was called to prepare the way, and we are called to be agents of hope and agents of change in our own communities. We are truly hopeful when we advocate for justice, when we advocate for healing, when we care for the marginalized, and when we work to heal this world that's so divided that we live in. So for those of you who are new here, you might not know that this campus, Grace Chapel, is affiliated with another campus in Frisco called Grace Avenue. It's on Main Street in Frisco. And for the several weeks leading up to Thanksgiving, they were collecting Thanksgiving foods for, to make meal boxes for people in their community that might need them. And during, over a series of events, I ended up here at this campus. We ended up in possession of 12 of those, or 12, four, four of those boxes. And I don't know if you've been to my office, but like we've unpacked a lot of this building, but like there's still a bunch of boxes in there and Thanksgiving was coming and I was trying to get out of town and I had these boxes and I wanted to make sure that they got into the hands of people who need them, but at the same time I was like, it's not perishable food. It could wait till I got back from Thanksgiving. Um, 
that's not a good idea. Um, so in order to live into the, the, the hope that is active, I just, I made a couple phone calls. I called and through our power pack team, I got some connections to some of the schools around here and I sent some emails. And by the end of the week, which all had to happen last week because the schools weren't in session this two weeks past week, um, we had all the boxes were accounted for by families who were in need of them. And we had another family that needed a gift card because we didn't actually end up having enough boxes. Um, and I say all of this not to pat myself on the back. I certainly don't deserve that. I wasn't going to do anything with them until God told me to do something. Um, reminded me that hope is active and you can't just sit on it. Um, I'm telling this story as an example of what active hope actually looks like. Our power pack team is out consistently week after week making connections in our community, finding out where the, where the needs are and serving the marginalized in our communities. And because of their work, we were able to serve again this time. Had they not been doing that work day in and day out, I don't know what we would have done with the boxes. But hope is not simply waiting, it's showing up with the incense in the sanctuary and it's going out and doing God's work every week and every day. And before we move away from this story and move on to the rest of our worship service, I want to point out something that I don't think I've mentioned before. And that is, like a lot of us in the room, Zachariah and Elizabeth had reason to feel hopeless. If we go back and read that scripture in verse 7, it says that they were getting on in years. And that is a nice way of saying that they were getting old. And they hadn't had children yet. They hadn't met the expectation of their society and their culture. And they were falling into despair. And they knew, even with the limited idea of knowledge of what science looked like back then, um, that the odds were stacked against them. That they were unlikely to have their hopes or their expectations met. And yet the story reminds us that the hope doesn't relieve us from challenges. The challenges are always going to be there. But it does, it does somehow transform the way that we can engage with those, trans with those challenges. Barrenness becomes possibility. Hopelessness unravels and reveals an active hope. And it is active hope for us each individually and for all of us together, for the whole of the world and for the whole of humanity. So as we journey through this Advent season, let us ponder what God might be preparing each of us to go and do. Let us embrace the hope that God offers, not as a fragile wish, not just as wishful thinking, not just as something that we ponder, but as a bold trust, a bold trust that God brings life into barren spaces. And let this hope inspire us to prepare the way for God's love and God's justice and God's healing for this world. And when we do this, we might find that hope is actually a strategy after all. Amen. Me again. I am grateful to be able to share the sacrament of Holy Communion with you on this particular Sunday. Like Zachariah, we come to the table. Um, we come to the table without fail whenever it's offered to us. And sometimes we feel a deep connection with God. And sometimes we're just going through the motions. But sometimes in the showing up and going through the motions and faithfully trusting God, that's how we demonstrate an active hope in our world. So we, I invite you to this table with us today. And for those of you who might be joining us online, this is an opportunity to go grab um, whatever elements you're going to use today, some bread, some juice, whatever it is that you need, some crackers. And the rest of us are going to begin. And as a part of communion, we have the opportunity to confess our sins before God and one another. So let us share in the prayer of confession together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The good news for us is Christ lived, died, and rose from the grave to forgive our sins by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up to us, he took the bread. 
he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus, in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves of pra in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry with all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf the bread which we break is a sharing of the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I'll invite those who are going to help serve communion to come forward. And while they're serving the band and getting things gathered here, I'm going to offer some, some instructions. Um, the first one being that this table is not... Grace Chapel's table. It is not the United Methodist Church's table. It is Christ's table. And all are invited to come forward. There's no exclusions. If you seek to partake, we invite you to come. Um, the second thing is um, logistically, we take communion here through intinction. Intinction is a fancy word for dipping. You'll be handed a piece of the bread, and then there'll be a cup, and you can dip it in the cup, and then you can immediately partake as you head back to your seats. Um, we also have, Jonathan and I will be here in the center. We believe in inclusion in many ways, so we have a gluten-free station. So if that's something that you need, just come to the center and let us know and we'll serve you your gluten-free elements here in the center. And I feel like there's one other thing, how to get back to your seats. So you're gonna come up these aisles. If you're here, you can go whichever's closest to you and, and be served here. And then the best way to get back to your seats is to go around the back aisles and come back up to your seats up the front believe that is logistically all of the things so the table is set and the ushers will send you forward as soon as everybody's ready thank you
for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. It's me again. <laughs> so, um, this is the time in the service where we talk about how our hope translates to a response of some kind and how God calls us to be active in what we do. Um, last week, if you were here, I know that Joshua introduced our stewardship campaign that you recall Embracing Change, and Lance and Deanna came up and spoke. I don't think they're here anymore. They were here at their earlier service. Um, if you didn't understand or you don't understand or you haven't been around church in a while, the stewardship campaign is simply a way that we budget for our next year. It's just like for your household, somewhere at the end of the year, you're going to look at January and you're going to try to determine what you've got to spend and how you're going to pay for things, and this is just how the church does that. And we ask that by logistically simply asking what you are able to plan to give to the church next year. I know, and this has been a journey for me, that for a long time I didn't know how the church was actually funded. I don't know what I actually thought. When I think about that, I'm like, that was kind of a, what was I actually thinking? How did I think the building got paid for? But 
I didn't know. I didn't know that it was our collective efforts. I didn't know that, that the way that the lights came on and the buildings, buildings were built and the, the way we fund our youth ministries and our children's ministry and our power pack program that we talked about and these Thanksgiving boxes and all of those things just happened by the, the good and charitable works of the people that are sitting here with us today. And so all I'm asking and all we're asking is that if you call this your home, if this is a place where you have found peace and belonging, that you consider letting us know so that we can plan well for next year. And I know that the church and money have not always been, um, been the best combinations of things in the history of the world. So we always wanna be really transparent about what we're doing. So if you have any questions at all about where your funding is going to, how you're participating in these sorts of things, um, talk to me, talk to Pastor Joshua, talk to our stewardship chairs when they're around, we can introduce you to them, and we'll make sure that we can answer your questions in the best way that we possibly can. Um, because we know that's the honest and good and holy thing to do. Logistically, you could scan this code at any time, or you can go to the Give tab on our website, and you can fill out an online commitment form for 2025. There are some paper cards out in the lobby if you want to pick one of those up and go home and pray over that and think about what this means to you in your life and your family. Um, you can bring that back to us, and you can slip it in the boxes in the back, or you could just hand it to somebody. We'll get an envelope and keep it confidential and get it turned into all the right places for, for budgeting purposes. And we're going to have some time later in December where we're going to celebrate. Um, there's definitely a financial number that they're trying to hit. I honestly don't remember that number. It felt pretty high to me, but like, it's what we need. But the bigger thing that we want to encourage is um, participation, because not every gift means something, no matter how small, no matter how large, it all collectively is part of it. We're not asking for everybody to give the same amount. We're just asking everybody to participate as best they can. So that is our Embrace Change Stewardship Campaign. Feel free to ask any questions that you have about that. Um, moving on, this is also the place in our service where we talk about not only our budgeting for next year, but what we need just to get through the rest of this year. And there, are, I'm not gonna read them all off to you, but there are several ways that you can give in this moment here. You can text, you can go to the website, you can scan that code. If you wanna, our ushers, no, not ushers. We don't have ushers doing this because we have the boxes in the back of the room. So we're not gonna have that moment where people come and pass baskets, but if you wanna fill out, there's envelopes in the back of the chairs, you can fill that out and you can drop that in the, box, the boxes on your way out today. Um, so that is our offering and giving moment and our stewardship moment here, will you pray with me? Holy God, in this season of Advent, we light the candle of hope, trusting in your promises and your presence among us. When the world feels dark, remind us that your hope calls us to respond. It calls us to co-create the world that we desire. It calls us to share of ourselves and our resources as we unravel the hopelessness that is all around us. Take these gifts and offerings and make them enough to do the work that you call us to do. The work of love and liberation, the work of justice and the work of mercy, the work of healing and the work of forgiveness, the work of hope. Multiply these gifts to be more than we could possibly imagine. May your grace overflow into our lives and beyond. We pray all of this in your name. Don't mind just standing with us one more time. We just want to say, God, we believe. We say this mountain can't be moved. They say this chains won't never break. But they don't know you like me. Oh, 
thank you for being here with us today. Um, just a reminder, if you are 6th through 12th grade and you want to hang out with us for youth, we're going to meet in this room right over there. Just head over there and Sam and I will get over there as soon as possible. I'm pretty sure the, heat, the queso is heated up, so we're ready to eat. Um, I just mentioned it earlier in the service. I'll mention it again. If you're new here, I would love for you to fill out a Connect card. You can hand that to... Um, uh, Lanelle, she's out in the, in the lobby. You can give it to me. You can give it to one of our ushers. We'll just reach out to you this week. We would love for you to fill that out. And for all of us, as we go out into the world this week, um, unraveling the hopelessness all around us, know that God is there. God shows up. God shows up, and then we show up for God, and together we create the world that we want. So go into this Advent season and ponder what it is that God might be calling you to do. Go in peace. Amen.